Uh, I'd like to introduce Paolo Pelagate. As it says, he's the archaeologist. Um, <laughs> and archaeologist working at the Hearst Museum of Anthropology, who has kindly agreed to inaugurate the spring lectures. And if you're not on the mailing list for announcements, there is a link on the ARC website where you can self-enroll um, with an introduction to the archaeological collections curated by the museum, which isn't the title that we... No, no, no. In fact, this is a, this a is bit not. of... A, this is a bit confusing. Sorry okay. about that, but... <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Rosemary, for the kind introduction. And welcome back, everybody, to the spring 2017 Berkeley semester at Berkeley. Two years ago, I was here attempting to provide a general overview of the archaeological collections curated at the Hearst. At least I was attempting to. It seemed a good time since the museum recently embarked in a massive renovation that, besides the many, many headaches, gave us a golden opportunity to dust off large amount of archaeological assemblages that had perhaps started to fade in our collective memory. And this was the, the introductory slide that I used last year, uh, two years ago. But today's presentation will focus on one of those collections, one that started very early and yet spending the entire time Kruber is at the head of the museum and the department. One of the reasons for this choice is that archaeologists from California and beyond are certainly familiar with the vast assemblages collected by the California Archaeological Survey starting from 1949. But the earlier collections and the names that are associated with, uh, with them might not ring a bell to many. While you might have heard of Nels Nelson or Yuli, how many of you remember people like Eugene Gollumstock? Indeed, during the entire time Kroeber was at the head of the institution, the museum maintained an interest in field archaeology, a strong interest in field archaeology, mostly aimed at increasing the collections while following tips and accidental discoveries from various sources. Between 1904 and 1949, the museum dispatched a number of archaeologists across the state, but by the late 30s, most of the museum resources and spaces were dedicated to the ethnographic collection, and the pace of archaeological research started to slow. And in this, um, it's a bit out of focus. No, oh, fantastic, thank you. Um, and in this slide, you can see some of the language that Krober starts to use in the mid 30s to um, signifying the slowing down of the pace of archaeological research in the field, at least when it comes to collecting material that comes back to the museum. The story of early archaeology in California is certainly a fascinating one, and I feel lucky to work in a place that was one of the centers of it. The personal stories of the archaeologists involved in these early endeavors became one of my principal interests. I discovered L. L. Loud after I visited Kent's class one day to recruit volunteers for one of our projects. With his well-known generosity, Kent introduced me to the class as the archaeologist that sits in Robert Iser's chair. As flattering as that, that sounded, I knew it was a bit misleading, and I got curious. Whose chair am I sitting in? L. L. Loud is one answer to that question. And I just would like to point out that this is an abstract of the obituary published in the annual report for the museum in 1947. And this is a picture of L. L. Loud wearing a garment made of bird skin that he collected at uh, uh, Lovelock Cave. Loud worked at the museum from 1911 until 1946. And he is on record as one of the most active field archaeologists after Nels Nelson. He was with Krober at the same time of Ishi. He worked at the museum until his death and even after. I should say now that L. L. Loud indeed donated a skeleton to the museum with the express wish to be used in the teaching of physical anthropology to college students. His skeleton is still on loan to Professor White Lab. Loud worked at the museum from 1911 until 1946. Uh, sorry. Uh, many of the sites he excavated remain quite relevant in today's archaeology, 
and while the yellow photos and dusty field notes radiate a sense of nostalgia, they also shine lights on a landscape that is now largely gone and is one of the reasons why this collection deserves special attention. Today's presentation wants to offer an, a brief overview of loud contributions to Berkeley anthropology, a contribution he made through his field research, certainly, but also through his publications. The slides on the screen are populated by sketches, notes, photographs, and comments he left in the archives of the Hearst Museum in over 30 years of employment. In addition, I will provide some testament of what has since been the faith of the sites he excavated and why his collection remains relevant today. Unfortunately, not much is known about L. L. Loud. When he died in Oakland in 1946, Krober pu published an obituary in American Antiquity, and you can see an abstract here, that remains the only source of information about his private life outside the museum. Krober told us that Loud was from a rural county in Maine that he left after graduating from high school at the age of 22. Loud made his way to California after years of different jobs in many places, but he also found the time to enroll as a student at the University of Washington. He continued to work and study at Berkeley between 1905 and 1910 with a focus on anthropology and religious studies. He actually entertained the idea of going to Africa as a missionary for a while. In 1911, Loud arrived at the museum where he worked as a guard, janitor, preparator, and an official field archaeologist until his death in 1946. In his obituary, Kruber also summarized in few lines his contribution to archaeology. And this is what how Kruber summarizes contribution to archaeology by naming few of the, few of the um, very uh, important sites that he excavated, not all of them, and there is a very quick distribution map of the sites that are mentioned here. But how big is that contribution? Because if you look at this picture, you probably don't get a sense of, you know, uh, of the magnitude. But a simple query from our database will give us a better sense of how big that contribution really is. And it will look like this, boring, but impressive. <laughs> a total of 9,000 catalog records from more than 300 sites. A massive contribution, and certainly for an, an unofficial archaeologist, he kept himself busy. I don't know what classes Loud attended at Berkeley, or if he received some field training before being dispatched for his first assignment by himself. He was in friendly terms with Nelson, we know that from the correspondence, and it is possible that Loud accompanied them in the field at times. We know he used Nelson's famous map of the Bay Area shell mound, as well as his notes, as a constant reference for much of the work Kruber tasked him to do. Whatever his academic background was, he certainly writes to his boss with a confident language from day one. And this is day one of Kruber in the field, and you can see what is what the tone of the message. He actually makes a joke that the water is freezing and the night is cold, but on the whole, it would be more comfortable living in the sunshine than in the shadow <laughs> of the museum. And I would also like to point out that if you're working under Kruber, you might find yourself in the cold on Christmas Eve. Despite the display of confidence, Loud was certainly aware that Kroeber, keenly aware probably, that Kroeber dismissed, brushly, Yuli's work at the Emeryville Shell Mound. Kroeber wrote that Yuli's interpretation of cultural change during the life of the mound was flawed. Kroeber believed that Indian culture had been substantially identical for hundreds or perhaps thousands of years, and of course this is an oversimplification. But so firm Kroeber was in his conviction, that no graduate student was allowed to study Central California archaeology until 1947, when Heiser came permanently to the department. 
did Loud feel the pressure of that environment? Well, I certainly would, but there is no answer for him. It is clear that Kroeber did not intend for Loud to feel that kind of academic pressure, but he was expecting him to follow strict instructions with minimal deviations, frequent communication, and within the allowed budget. And this started with the first project in Santa Clara County in 1911. So the Pons, or Cosuto, or Castro Mound, Santa Clara one, it's the trinomial, is the first assignment in the field for Loud to execute by himself. The site, oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, the mound was being, uh, the site was already known from the Nelson survey a few years back and was tested by a professor at Stanford one year earlier. The mound was being used for soil, and so Loud was sent to salvage some of the antiquities that were popping up from the ground. Loud collected about 400 objects and recognized at least one house floor and left one nice uh, sketch of it, um, at least one house floor within the mound matrix. He didn't think much about its antiquity, and while the mound has been excavated later by Yukas, Loud collection was never published. The site is a very good example of the radical changes that happened in California landscape in the last 80, 90 years. The exact location of the mound is no longer clear. Two years ago, <coughs> also because it's uh, under many parking lots and many, many buildings, two years ago, barracks actually, colleagues working for the National Guard came to the museum to look at Loud and other people's map and sketches as the guard was planning work in the area and they were really hoping to avoid the mound. Our, our colleagues promised to be in touch with the museum just to let us know. We're not really involved in the research, but just to let us know that they relocated the mound if, if they do. The, in, this, in this photo, there's also one good example of the, of the, the way Loud used to describe his things. It's, you know, in a way, a, a bit naive, we can see it today, but truthful and honest. <laughs> During the spring of 1912, Loud leaves California for the Nevada Plateau, Churchill County, where he will spend five months, mostly camping, surveying and testing many surface sites. And here's uh, one excerpt from the publication explaining just very quickly. And here's a sample, of course, of the many, many objects he collected from the desert surface in Nevada. Um, while this is an image of how these sites in the desert look like many years later in 1965, when Heiser and the Department of Anthropology will revisit loud sites for new excavations, and yet and so large collections came to the museum as a result of those uh, <coughs> new uh, expeditions as well. Following instructions from Kroeber and Merriam, Loud arrived at Lovelock Cave, where he attempted to rescue as much material possible from the guano deposit that had been mined already for almost a decade. He wrote to Kroeber the conditions under which he was operating. And you can see here, the, the, is camping, we know that, but is also cooking with uh, water that comes from a barrel because it's fresh, but it's muddy and it refuses to settle after being drunk. So he, I think it deserves sympathy just for this. Uh, he sifted the guano diggers back to it and located many spots where the deposit was at time less intact or less disturbed. Uh, more intact, uh, intact or less disturbed. From these lots, he recovered more than 1,500 catalog records. And when I say catalog record, doesn't mean single objects. One catalog record might contain more than one object. So 1,500 catalog records might total to about three, 4,000 objects in total. They included mummies, 
basketry, textiles, the famous duck decoys, and, hunter, uh, and other hunting tools, all of them in amazing state of preservation. And here's an, uh, an old map that they eventually published uh, in 1924, in 1929, sorry, uh, where the, the location of this intact pockets of deposit that he excavated. So Loud wrote to Merriam about his findings and his desire to continue his work there. He believed strongly in the potential of the cave. And you can see the language that he's using with Merriam that at that point is at the, the Department of Paleoanthropology. He insisted with Kroeber later about the need to continue digging and even defied more than one order from Kroeber to disengage from the cave and go back to Berkeley. And here's what he answered one time. You might answer back, no money. But then when a gold mine is really discovered, there is usually enough money discovered to develop it. And if you do not discover the money, the American Museum or the Smithsonian Institution will. It seems to me that such a collection should not go to the East Coast. The collection from Nevada all together will ultimately include more than 3,000 cattle records from about 20 different sites that he mapped and recorded. He included some of great antiquity, like the Leonard Rock, uh, the Leonard Rock Shelter, uh, Pershing 14, the trinomial, in Pershing County. The details of his expedition would be published many years later in the Lovelock volume co-authored by co-authored by Mr. Uh, with Mr. Harrington from the Smithsonian Institution. The Smithsonian excavation was followed by numerous other expeditions in the cave from different institutions. The museum, the Hearst Museum, will accession the assemblages collected by Heiser in 1930, 1946, and 1969, making the Hearst Museum collection of Lovelock Cave probably the biggest one out there. Lovelock Cave is still a very well-known place in American archaeology and beyond. The name is always the center, was, had been the center of many stories, legends, and also many hoaxes. It is now a protected site under the management of BLM. But I want to close with other excerpts from uh, Kroeber writing to Mr. Loud and showing still some disappointment in how the job has been done and he keeps reminding him that you, I can judge more accurately and more quickly the results to date if you were to sit down for three days and write description. He really doesn't like, he really doesn't like uh, Lau to use his time in the field to study whatever he's collecting or to, 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 uh, to, to look at the, the things he's collecting. He really um, wants Lau to just get in touch with him very quickly. And another little uh, comment that will kind of follow us for, for many years. The, while Lovelock Cave was immediately uh, recognized as one incredibly important place, Kroeber still doesn't miss the opportunity to say, well, how can we put this on exhibit? It's really dusty and it's really not. But, you know, if we clean it, it, it would make it for, for something. Kroeber was never a big fan of the, the exhibit galleries and, and at the museum. He didn't think that the museum should dedicate that many resources to exhibits. One of the many things, that, uh, one of the many char characteristics of <laughs> Kroeber that are less known. The Presidio Mound, San Francisco 6, was a short period that only lasted for 10 days in the fall of 1912. It resulted from a tip received by Kroeber and Gifford during the work for the World Fair. And here's a uh, little uh, newspaper clipping that uh, talks about that accidental discovery. Um, the museum had some objects that were collected from around the Presidio back in, in 1872, but they were accompanied by very little information. 
So Loud, for the first time, record, records the mound in 1912, but in the end, he arrived too late to excavate it, because most of the mound was already covered by feet and feet of soil in order to make the platform for, for uh, the World Fair um, buildings. Um, he then advised Gifford and Kruber to call off a bigger project. The site was forgotten until 1976, when the army inadvertently discovered a deeply buried human burial nearby. <laughs> Michael Morato did whatever salvaging was possible, but the notes of Loud remain today the primary record of the Presidio Mound. His detailed sketch map and photos were used almost 90 years later in 2001 by uh, various CRM companies to relocate the mound before the construction of Doyle Drive that is now part of our landscape. The highway, in those days, the highway was rerouted around the mound, and the site is now preserved under the care of the Presidio Trust. And, of course, my lovely wife, who couldn't be here today because our child is feverish. <laughs> of the original small collections of 26 catalog records, how about half of it was eventually discarded, as you can see from the stamps in the catalog cards. What was not discarded, fortunately, are the photos that accompany the manuscript. And these photos really show a place that is completely different. Can anyone recognize Chrissy Fields? and the Golden Gate Bridge. The, the, the pillar, the first pillar of the Golden Gate Bridge will appear here about 20 years later. The photos are fun. The photos are in the archives of the Hearst Museum are absolutely fantastic. Few weeks later, he is dispatched to San Mateo County to test some mounds in Half Moon Bay. Why did the museum have such opportunity is not clear from the manuscript or the correspondence, but the dig is a big disappointment for Loud since day one. And he expresses his disappointment in funny words. It's like, I'm disappointed. I'm not finding any sea monsters. <laughs> it, it, it probably took a lot of, I would say guts, but it's probably the wrong word to, to write back to Kroeber. It is bo your boss. <laughs> You're in the field. And he still makes jokes every time. And we'll see how that goes, of course. Uh, he will collect about 300 objects, all similar, this mostly pitted stones or sinkers, um, and hence one of the disappointment. Um, all similar to the one in the photo, but soon he suggests Kruber to call him off the field and back at the museum. This is how he argues with Kruber about the little value he perceived these mounds in Apple Bay had. And I would like to read, like, we can be sure that the Indians did not have much of a metropolis at Half Moon Bay. Um, their metropolis would, was doubtless where our metropolis will ultimately be, at Richmond, while they come down here for summer vacation, the same as we whites do, and also to get a baloney shells. History repeats itself. But, and then he asks again, please take me off the field. This is really not worth. Uh, from his language, is what, what is interesting in the language, it appears that he starts to feel even more confident in his ability to judge the value of an excavation. And he's been in the field for like a few months at this point, not, not very many, um, to, uh, to judge the ability, the value of an excavation. At the Presidio, he realized that he, need, he would need an enormous amount of resources in order to uh, entertain the excavation. And that was the reason why he asked Robert and Gifford to call him off. But in this case, he tells that the site itself is not worth exploring. Please call me back. Ask and you shall receive. And two weeks later, Loud is dispatched to Glen Cove near Vallejo, where he spent yet another very cold Christmas, <laughs> December 22. Um, the um, he spent a very cold Christmas excavating a site that was almost pristine. The preservation was also very good. 
I, uh, on December 25th, it's Friday evening, have not time to make out a full report. Folks are going to Vallejo for Christmas time. It is a cold job laying on my stomach, picking it to pieces with travel of jackknife. Uh, and he was talking about the charcoal, that he, was, the, the, he found pockets of charcoal and he was really keen in collecting all the pockets of charcoal. This is a catalog card for a charcoal sample. Um, the preservation was also very good and he took great care at excavating many fragments of textiles and basketry. They are still very rare items in California archaeology or in, in, in the archaeology of Central California. And you can see some of the sketches that he made in the field of this textiles or basketry fragments. But it is certainly unfortunate that this collection still lays unpublished. The site was only minimally touched for many decades after, and it is now a protected area under the Greater Vallejo Recreational District. The photo is from Google Maps. Uh, the, 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 the Glen Cove was, the Glen Cove and uh, Sonoma 239, Solano 239, was, was in the news for, for a long time, but about six years ago. It was <coughs> when they started to prepare the park, it was known as a burial mound. The, the, that in the area, there was a presence of a burial mound and that was excavated many years before. And it, it, it it had been, it was very difficult for a while for the Vallejo Recreational District to uh, make everybody, all the constituents involved, happy and eventually protect the site uh, and in, in, the, in, the, in the park. Now, next assignment is the famous expedition in Humboldt Valley in Wyatt Territory between July and October 1913. It would be the peak of loud careers in the field, and also the one for his name is still recognized today, together with Loblock Cave, of course. Kroeber said of the publication that it survives, many years later, it survives as fundamental contributions to the prehistory of the Pacific coast. This was written in Loud Obituary. At the same time, the project strained the professional relationship between Loud and Kroeber almost to a break. Years later, Heiser found the correspondence between the two, stored in, first stored it into a manuscript that he eventually published in the Art series with the title, Get It Through Your Head and Yours for the Revolution. In the introduction, Heiser did a great job putting the documents in their historical context. I really highly suggest to read the volume. It is a very short one, and it's readily available online, uh, both on the ARF uh, repository for, for digital documents and through the, through the library. Today, I can only offer a preview of how Loud and Kromer, Kroeber came very close to turn away from each other. The language is as strong as politeness and professional respect allow them. So, uh, in, so um, in this case, I really wanted to follow up a little bit and read some, uh, some abstracts from, from this. The, the, the Loud expedition and this manuscript put into context the, 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 the brewing uh, trouble that starts to uh, happen, start to take Kruber and, and, and Loud away a little by little. Um, and it is Loud insistent on talking about money or the lack thereof, and his alleged inability to report frequently enough that begin to irritate Kruber. In this case, as you can see, this is the first letter from, from Humboldt County, and Loud tells Kroeber that he has landed, he set housekeeping, and then proceeds to ask for more money, because the money he has apparently are not enough. Um, Kroeber responds to that, and you can see how he starts to get irritated. Since you left here, more than two weeks ago, I have heard from you only once and then mainly about money, which you wanted. You state merely that you had a mound to work and made camp, purchased provision for two months. The nature of the mound, the prospects, its relation to other, 
division of your time between serving and digging and all other matters of scientific nature, I am completely in the dark about. Please post me on this point and continue to keep me posted. Cubitation with loud progresses as the project continues and then real threats getting fired are mentioned. Loud does not retreat or cave in and keeps voicing his concern and even seems to accuse Kruber of being the reason many scholars were leaving Berkeley, which is certainly true for Yuli, or very, very likely true for Yuli. But again, so you did write a letter to me while in Nevada that did cut me, and I have realized ever since that I was not appreciated. I have felt that if I ever get where I will be appreciated, I must take the trail that is now pretty well beaten by men such as Barrett, Goddard, Nelson, Sapper, and others, perhaps that I don't know, all going away from UC Berkeley. And <laughs> seems to point a finger there. <laughs> <laughs> Money aside, it is apparent that Loud feels that he is underappreciated and micromanaged, probably unfairly. He perhaps perceives that Kroeber doesn't trust him fully, and perhaps never will. So maybe a change in career might be in order. And the change in career is interesting to read, and I hope is not cut. But uh, it says here, oops, I'm so sorry. Um, I want to say that I'm not cut by your letter. I am, however, becoming a staunch socialist. And some of these days, I might be elected to the legislature or something or another uh, by the rapidly increasing socialist vote. <laughs> that sounds <laughs> old at this point. Um, Loud and Kruber will eventually come to an understanding that will permit the project to end in more than a thousand catalog records and still be perceived today as a successful, as a successful project. Um, again, I would, like, I would like to invite people to read that manuscript. It's a fascinating window on, on the personality of, Cro of a personality of Kroeber that you rarely can see from, from, from his publications. Uh, the next phase of Loud Career at the Museum the next phase of Loud Careers at the Museum started with a few years of absence from the field, after which he never went back by himself. In 1922, Loud is involved in the excavation of some notable mounds in Richmond. Which is one is actually either under or to a walking distance from the new Regatta building where the museum has its new storage facility. Loud is there to help Leonard Outwhite, but he would publish the full report on the shell mounds two years later. Now you can see the, 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 the cover. Also, in 1922, Loud will assist Schenck in the now famous excavations of the Emeryville 1924 that would be published two years later. But Loud's name will not be on the cover, even though Schenck was very generous in his thanking of Loud for his help at the, at, the, at the Emeryville Shell Mound. The Emeryville Shell Mound was excavated again between 1995 and 1998 during the construction work that included what is now the IKEA building. It was an excavation surrounded by commotion and protest, and I believe that most people in this audience will remember those days. After many years in an Oakland basement, the final collection from the Emeryville Shell Mound, which was once believed to be the largest ancient mound of the Bay Area, are now accessioned in the Hearst and will be available for research in the near future. Loud will also return to Lovelock Cave in 1924. And the luck of uh, the Smithsonian Institution, that's the season where all the famous duck decoys are found, and in fact, all these duck decoys are now in Washington and not at the Hearst Museum. <laughs> uh, 
Between 1926 and 1931, Loud leaves the museum for reasons that Kroeber does not elaborate on, except mentioning that he's building a house in Auckland. Uh, we have the address for the house. It, even the house does not exist anymore. It's, been, it's under a parking lot as well. When the museum is moved from San Francisco to Berkeley in 1931, Lloyd joins it again its ranks. During this time, he will be at times dispatched in the field for small projects or to help others with their work. Allah will, however, spend many, many years at the museum writing notes like this one that I would like to read for you. Example of Heiser never using a map in the field or, um, or a compass or knowing within miles of where he is. Sometimes not knowing even the county or state. Fenenga is also hit or miss. Are there two Lisbon schools 2.3 miles apart? And then continues. And at the end, uh, and the end uh, on the retro of this card, the, the back of this card will say, this is a clear example of the middle-headiness of the <laughs> Sacramento Junior people. Uh, you can <laughs> um, so patiently going through his and other people's notes, redacting adding and adding in them. Most of the early manuscripts that preceded those later accumulated by the Yucas bear some of his markings in his characteristic handwriting. These markings show that L. L. Oud had an uncommon attention to details, and he was certainly not afraid of hard work, all characteristics that would make him still a great fit for the museum today. <laughs> Thank you very much. I kept it short, so <laughs> if we have to. Uh, absolutely. Please. Do you know anything about his family? I mean, uh, like, was he married or? Uh, no. Uh, Kro uh, Krober obituary says that once he left rural, count, uh, rural Maine, never went back. Uh, what we do know is that he graduated very late from high school because he couldn't attend school during the winter time. So he had to just go when the when ice eroded and everything was clear. I mean, I looked at the picture of the area. It looks pretty rural today. So I only wonder what it looked like when 1912. Uh, I, then according to uh, Kroeber, came all the way we don't know how long it took for him to go from Maine to Washington State and then California. But in his will, the will where he left the, the skeleton at, at, to the museum, he mentions a brother that somehow would be the only one that if someone wants to get in touch with the family, the brother should still be alive somewhere in Maine. Let him know that I'm dead and my body is at the museum. Uh, I don't know if anyone ever followed. Uh, my understanding of, Mac, of Loud Skeleton after he's, he died, where they, um, from the Oakland Museum, he went straight to Macau Laboratories, or office, uh, and then from there, probably straight to Professor White Lab. I, I don't think <laughs> Loud has ever been in the museum, together with the, the other human remains. So the brother, uh, I found the brother online on an old um, document scan on Google for, for the, the, the high school, the Caribou High School it was called, the Caribou High School. Um, the brother attended the, the same school, so we know the name of the brother, but that's about it, about the family. <coughs> Scottish, again, according to Loud, uh, according to Kroeber. With Scottish descent. Mm -hmm. His first name doesn't look Scottish, it looks Welsh. 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 That's what I've been told many times. I, I, I have a hard time, of course, pronouncing his name. Llewellyn? 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 Llewellyn. Um, too bad that Krober is no longer around. <laughs> but it'd be nice to, to have a straight record for, for, for Loud at the museum. Please. Well, hey, thanks for. Uh, most interesting talk. So we have a lot of cultural resource management companies that yes. in the museum, and they are definitely, as you talked about, 
using Loud's notes and they're Absolutely, yes. locating a lot of these yes. sites. Uh, and my question is, is how much return do those CRM companies get back to the museum? That is, do we get their reports and do we get much information back from them when they work? Like the speech mound was just worked on just uh, two, three years ago. Yeah, no, I, I remember the excavation yeah. because... Uh, do, do they, because do they, they always ask permission to come in and work on them. Do, yeah. do we actually get much back and is there a kind of a, that is, is there kind of a longitudinal kind of study of some of these sites? Uh, well, we, we, normally, we normally ask people uh -huh. to provide, especially when they come to the museum and using our collection, yeah. maps or, or looking at objects. Yeah. We normally ask people if whenever you're done or you publish, would you please let us know and maybe send us a copy. Yeah. Um, we try to enforce that as much as possible without, pester, without pestering people. Yeah. Um, the reality at the same time is the museum is not longer registered as an official state information sure. center uh -huh. and therefore they don't have they, a lot of CRM companies, especially those that don't have a relationship with the museum, don't feel that they are in, in any way uh, mandated to send the museum this information. And this has been, it's been going on for a while. And so while I would love to, my going further, going forward, what I'm afraid is the large gap that we're going to have in the archive from where we actually worked as a state repository um, up until 59 probably uh, to now. So how are we going to fill that gap in order to make sure that we have all the information across the chronological time and the spanning. And but, but the relationship with CRM companies, <laughs> at the very least because CRM companies it's 90% of archaeology in the state these days. Sure. The relationship with CRM companies should be uh, nurtured a little bit more yeah, yeah. By, by the museum. Yeah, Please. Um, any update about Lovelock Cave? I uh, heard that, that there are still lots of stuff left in the back there. <coughs> Is it some kind of innovation for? For tourists, you said to yeah, visit. Oh, yeah, in terms of uh, making the site a little bit more accessible. Uh, to be honest, I don't know. Okay. Uh, to be honest, I don't know. Uh, um, what the museum heard in the last again the the the, the, the legend about the giant redheads that. <laughs> Uh, lived in Lovelock Cave keeps coming up uh, every two or three years. <laughs> it's still coming up, and there's always some researcher that is wants to come to the museum and look at the, the skeletons to <coughs> see if one of these is big. We know it's protected. We know BLM decided many years ago that this is it. Nobody is touching Lovelock ever, ever again. Very, very like, very much like Spirit Cave in that way. But I don't know if they ever prepared some some sort of like welcome and and the site is actually visible. Uh, no, no, I we don't really I I don't personally communicate with BLM much, so I wouldn't know. But I I, I can find the information. I can let you know. I know it's not easy. To, it's not an easy place to reach. So even if it's prepared for accepting tourists, I don't know how many people will actually venture <laughs> there. But build it, and they, they will come, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, if there are no other questions, thank you very much for coming today. <laughs> welcome, back to the, welcome back to another semester at UC Berkeley. I hope it's going to be exciting for everybody. <laughs>